youth conference that started two days ago, a lot of ideas, a lot of energy was invested. But also, it's the first day of the DG meeting of the youth ministries as well. And I will take this moment to welcome you all. And thank you very much for taking the time to be here in Romania in order to, well, hopefully shape a better future for young people all over Europe. Secondly, it's a special day because it's not any day when we have the chance to interact with uh, actors that are relevant when it comes to youth and youth development and youth work. With no further ado, the whole session is going to look as follows. We are going to have a message sent by the Prime Minister, Ms. Viorica Vasilica Dancila, and uh, we have with us Ms. Vice Prime Minister Anna Birchal to send the message. Then we're going to have some warm up questions for our four guests, and then we'll start the dialogue. Are we good? Yes, are you ready? Good, wonderful. Then allow me to introduce Ms. Anna Birchal, Vice Prime Minister in the government of Romania to send us the message of the, of the Prime Minister, Ms. Verica Vaslica Dancila. Mulțumesc foarte mult. Bună dimineața și vă mărturisesc că nu pot să exprim în cuvinte cât de onorată sunt să mă aflu astăzi în fața dumneavoastră. Good morning very, uh, very much. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning everyone and each of you. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, on behalf of the Prime Minister and the Romanian government to wish you the best and uh, to really um, share with you the fact that uh, we are very grateful for the debates that were taking place in the past uh, few days, for the lessons that rec and recommendations that you gave to us. Acum permiteți-mi să vă prezint în numele doamnei prim-ministru și al Guvernului României uh, salutul domniei sale și să vă spun că realmente este o plăcere să fiu alături de dumneavoastră și să vă împărtășesc faptul că această conferință de tineret a Uniunii Europene cu siguranță este unul dintre cele mai importante evenimente dedicate a agendei tinerilor europeni, dar și un eveniment special pentru președinția română la Consiliul Uniunii Europene, datorită caracterului său aparte, care pune accent pe participarea tinerilor. Astfel, încep prin a saluta implicarea tinerilor români în organizarea evenimentului și asigurarea bunei sale desfășurări și doresc să vă felicit pe toți pentru organizarea unor evenimente de real succes în cadrul cărora tinerii și-au putut exprima ideile, planurile și proiectele care să-i pună mai bine în valoare și să le ofere șansa unei mai bune implicări. Stimate domnule comisar, dragă coleg, membru al Guvernului, dragă ministru, stimați invitați, vreau să vă spun că avem convingerea că reuniunile găzduite aici s-au ridicat la nivelul așteptărilor din toate punctele de vedere, al calității dezbaterilor și al argumentelor și ideilor susținute, precum și al pasiunii cu care acestea sunt exprimate și expuse interlocutorilor. Ori acest lucru era de așteptat, pentru că pe parcursul acestei săptămâni au avut la București tineri cu experiențe de viață și cu formare educațională sau profesională diferite, dar cu interese comune, atunci când vine vorba de cele două teme propuse de conferință, dialogul UE cu tinerii și viitorul muncii. Pe de o parte, dialogul UE cu tinerii este un proces amplu care vine în întâmpinarea așteptărilor tinerilor, care urmărește identificarea de soluții împreună cu aceștia și care invită factorii de decizie, guverne și alte autorități centrale sau locale la acțiune, în așa fel încât problemele și provocările cu care ne confruntăm astăzi la nivelul european să nu persiste și să nu fie amplificate pe viitor cu riscul de a prejudicia interesele generațiilor viitoare. Și putem lua exemplul ocuparea tinerilor, ocuparea tema ocupării tinerilor, temă în privința căreia Uniunea Europeană și statele membre nu au fost pasive, ci au recunoscut amploarea consecințelor generate pe piața forței de muncă, în special în rândul tinerilor, de recenta criză economică. Și au inițiat măsuri precum schema de garanție pentru tineri, 
locuri de muncă pentru tineri sau programul Corpul European de Solidaritate, dedicat din nou tinerilor. Efectele pozitive se simt. Dacă ne uităm la rata șomajului în rândul tinerilor, care se află în prezent în scădere, dar problemele nu sunt pe deplin rezolvate. Pe de altă parte, participarea tinerilor în viața publică este sănătoasă, pentru că ea contribuie la ameliorarea procesului de luare a deciziilor și, în definitiv, la consolidarea democrației noastre europene. Poate că nu întotdeauna vom lua, vom lua deciziile care să mulțumească toate punctele de vedere, dar atâta timp cât vom reuși să stimulăm implicarea tinerilor, vom avea la dispoziție mecanismele potrivite de îmbunătățire a procesului de luare a deciziilor. Din munca în echipă cu tinerii am învățat că faptele reprezintă măsura adevărată a caracterului nostru, oferind șanse tinerilor ambițioși, dornici de afirmare și interesați să se implice pentru ca lumea în care trăim să se schimbe în bine, contribuim direct la consolidarea prezentului și la asigurarea viitorului, crescând în mod responsabil noi generații de lideri. De aceea îmi doresc ca profesionalismul și inițiativa de care atât de mulți dintre voi dați dovadă în fiecare zi, să vă determine, la un moment dat, atunci când veți considera voi că este necesar, să fiți cetățeni nu numai implicați, dar să fiți implicați și în luarea deciziilor și să vă puneți în valoare potențialul acționând în interesul tuturor cetățenilor noștri. Când vorbim de viitorul Uniunii noastre, este crucial, așadar, să menținem interesul tinerilor pentru implicarea în viața publică. Aceste exerciții de consultare și participare, facilitate de dialogul UE cu tinerii, ne permit să ne gândim cu optimism la, viitorul, la faptul că viitorul Uniunii se află în mâinile unor generații cu un simț civic puternic dezvoltat. Am afirmat de fiecare dată că avem responsabilitatea de a crea oportunități pentru tineri, că tinerii sunt o prioritate națională. Iar dacă investim în educația lor, în dezvoltarea lor personală și profesională, succesul nu va întârzia să apară. Pentru că investiția în educație nu este o cheltuială, ci o garanție a unui viitor mai bun pentru generațiile prezente și viitoare. Îmi doresc ca tinerii de valoare și cu inițiativă să se implice tot mai mult în cât mai multe domenii ale vieții publice, dar mai ales în viața politică, în administrația centrală și locală sau în diplomație. Acestea fiind domenii în care vocea tinerilor trebuie să se facă mai bine auzită. Tinerii sunt viitorul României, resursa strategică a țării. Programul de guvernare pe care îl punem în aplicare acordă un rol fundamental tinerilor prin măsuri și strategii țintite menite să pună în valoare ambiția, profesionalismul și entuziasmul tinerilor. Am demarat programe care pun în prim plan tinerii, am alocat resurse, astfel încât să asigurăm noilor generații un viitor aici, acasă, în România. Inițiative de succes precum Startup Nation, programe de integrare a tinerilor pe piața muncii sau programul de internship al guvernului, pentru a da doar câteva exemple, sunt numai uh, uh, câteva măsuri care au avut rezultate remarcabile și care au fost receptate favorabil de un număr foarte mare de tineri. De aceea, prioritatea guvernului din care fac parte este că tinerii să aibă șansa de a se realiza aici, în România, și de aceea guvernul uh, Viorica Dăncilă asigură convingerea că investiția în tineri este o investiție în viitorul nostru. Eu vând un viitor frumos pentru România și pentru tinerii noștri și doar împreună putem transforma mai repede acest viitor în realitate. Cu lideri proveniți din tânăra generație vă pot spune că nu numai România va fi pe mâini bune și este pe mâini bune, dar și Uniunea Europeană va fi și este pe mâini bune. Tuturor tinerilor vă urez să vă îndepliniți visele, să aveți încredere în forțele proprii și să luptați cu entuziasmul caracteristic vârstei pentru a vă clădi drumul în viață așa cum vi-l doriți. Vă mulțumesc foarte mult și vă doresc o zi extraordinar de bună. Thank you so much and I wish you a very, very uh, good day, a very successful debate. And look very much forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Anna Bricial, Vice Prime, Vice Prime Minister for Romania Strategic Partnership Implementation. And uh, we thank you very much for taking your time. We know how busy your schedule is and uh, for kicking off the discussions. And just one thing we'd like to, to, to send you. 
because this is probably uh, a key message that has been sent during this, uh, during this uh, conference. Yes, young people are the future, but they're young right now and they have concrete needs right now. Therefore, we need to take care of their needs in the present. Thank you very much. Now, before moving on to the next uh, round, I would like to kindly ask you to warm up ourselves a little bit. Therefore, uh, I would like to kindly ask you to rise, to stand, and we're going to make a little exercise that hopefully will show exactly what's going to happen in a few moments. And yeah, I would like to kindly ask you to look around, to look around you, look up there, and look at all these brilliant people and ideas that keep coming around. And then when you see one that you like, grab it. <laughs> Do grab it. Okay, and that's one other one, and that's another one, and there is another one, and there is another one, and another one. Okay, and now can you please put them in a package? It's your box. It's your dialogue box that needs to be sent towards these people here. And soon you'll have the chance to do it. Okay, thank you very much. You may now have a seat. And let's start our introductory uh, key messages. Uh, and I would like to kindly ask each of the, uh, of the participants to answer to one of the, uh, of the questions that we have. And while I'm going to ask the question also, I will uh, kindly introduce each one of you. And uh, we're going to start with uh, the EU Commissioner for Education, Culture, Youth and Sport, Mr. Tibor Navracis. Thank you very much for taking the time to be today with us. And we know that Europe is it's going through a lot of transformations lately. Um, we have just adopted a youth strategy last November. Uh, commission had an important role in, uh, in uh, that process. Also, young people were set up since Bratislava meeting to be one of the key, uh, key priorities in Europe. And within this context, I would like to kindly ask uh, Mr. Navracic, which do you think there are the most three important challenges that uh, people, young people are facing in the future of Europe with all this political and social uh, context that we're having right now? Your choice. Yeah, maybe it's better. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Or maybe you can come, you can come here for this one. And then we'll settle in the meanwhile with the, with the, others, one, with the others as well. well. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to be here in, in Bucharest in this um, very important conference on the future with the people of the future. Um, when we talk about challenges, I think basically and at, at a very abstract level, our challenges remain the same. We have, a, we have economic challenges and we have societal challenges. But what is the most important thing is, is, uh, is the main challenge which is behind all of these partial challenges, I would say partial challenges, and that's the challenge of the future generations to be autonomous, responsible, and committed citizens of a democratic society. I would say a democratic and a competitive society, competitive in both meaning, in the meaning of uh, economic com uh, competitiveness, but also in the meaning of the social competitiveness. What we have to do, and, and uh, if I can say only one message, that would be my message, is that in the future, in the upcoming years, we have to harness more efficiently all the synergies at our disposal, because uh, we all know the internal structure of youth policy. We all know all the fundamental dilemmas if we pursue the policy goals 
of, of the youth policy as a separate silo, separated from uh, other policies, or as a horizontal responsibility, which, is, which has the aspects inbuilt all, in all other uh, policies. Uh, I would go for a, for a combined approach, and that's why I would argue for, for a, um, a more efficient usage of, um, of the synergies, because I think we have a lot more opportunities to use if we take all the synergies into account. Let me just very briefly go across all those challenges. We have the economic challenges. Of course, we know the youth unemployment is still very high in some countries. However, it is lower than it was in 2014 when we, when we entered uh, the office. But, uh, but I still think that youth unemployment is unbearably high in some countries and we have to tackle and we have to keep it low in, in other member states as well. But uh, we can keep uh, the level of youth unemployment low only in case if we put together the, the aspects and the points of uh, a good quality education, a safe social environment, good prospects for the personal development, meaning uh, a good quality education beyond the schools, in the peer groups, non-formal and informal educational forms in, in peer groups, for instance, or uh, funding grassroots sports activities, uh, social inclusion, social integration, all those areas which uh, probably accompany the educational systems or the functioning of the educational systems, but not, uh, the, not at the core of the educational activities. And um, we have to do more to, to help uh, young people live a uh, more fulfilled life. If we take uh, social competitiveness, we have to do more for, uh, for building up cohesive more integrated societies. Again, how to tackle social marginalization, social frustration, how to tackle all those problems which can frustrate young people, which can turn them towards radical or even extremist solutions, either in political or in, in societal life. And uh, we have to put together all these social factors which combined can be uh, a powerful device for tackling all these uh, divine, divine elements of the society. And uh, again, if we take EU funds and, and all those funds which are at our disposal in the next multi-annual financial framework, for instance, from, from 2021, we will double Erasmus, which means more money for educational and social integration uh, projects and also, of course, youth uh, policy projects and youth projects. We're going to have the European Solidarity Corps. The Deputy Prime Minister just mentioned the European Solidarity Corps as a very important institution or device for, um, for social integration, for building up a European identity at European level, for building up a, a European community at European level. But we also can harness the opportunities of the regional funds, of the cohesion funds, and all those funding machineries of the European Union, which combined with Erasmus, with Creative Europe, and with all other uh, devices can be very blessful for you and beneficial for youth policy uh, purposes. So we have to take an holistic approach. Uh, we have to be more comprehensive and we have to identify those policy goals which can uh, be reached in various, probably non-usual ways of financing. On the other hand, we have to use all the community building exercises in the future. I think Erasmus uh, gives us very good instructions how to go for um, a more comprehensive, more inclusive, European identity, which is not antagonistic to any other loyalties or any other identities. It's not antagonistic to, to, to local identities, to regional loyalties, to national right, uh, loyalties or, or other 
royalties, and that's the way we have to follow, I think, uh, when we want to build up uh, more powerful, more cohesive young communities. And that's why we need your contribution as well, because youth organizations can be very important allies to find and identify young people beyond youth organizations, non-organized young people, sometimes marginalized uh, young people who have no voice in contemporary societies. We have to express their ideas, we have to help them express their ideas, and we have to involve them into this youth dialogue. That's why I think this new youth strategy can be um, a very important cornerstone of the future youth policy, and I absolutely rely on your contribution, on your help, and I'm looking, looking forward to, uh, to cooperating with you in the upcoming months and, and years in youth policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Navracic. Uh, now we're going to move on to our second guest, because uh, youth is one of those fields that in European Union is belonging to the so-called subsidiarity fields, meaning that basically the whole decision lies within the member states. Uh, however, we have a youth strategy, therefore some links need to be done between what's happening at European level and what is happening at national level. Therefore, our next guest is uh, Mr. Konstantin Bogdan Matei, Minister for Youth and Sport, and I would like to, to kindly ask him if you are to pick one, only one, of the 11 youth goals that have been developed uh, through the youth strategy, and you, f you feel that that's the one that Romania needs to look to it with priority, which would be that youth goal and why? Thank you. Mulțumesc. Eu am să încerc să cobor ca să fim mult mai aproape unii de ceilalți. I will uh, step down to be closer to you. Pentru că tot vorbim astăzi tinerilor. Because we este foarte important să fim foarte aproape unii de ceilalți, să ne simțim aproape. To be close one to another. Toate temele sunt foarte importante. All uh, subjects are very important. De calitate but I think quality employment for youth concerns noi, all of us and implicitly all of you present today. And I wish to thank you. Our discussions today, we owe them to you, not to us, and certainly not to me as the Minister, Minister of Sports and Youth, a position that uh, honors me but also gives me a lot of responsibility. This ministry is divided in two stages, the youth and the sports. If, once, if it were one subject to choose as the Minister of Youth and Sports would be to combine the two, youth and sports, because this is very important. Why? Because among young people, each of you from the countries where you belong, you have your own champions, European champions, world champions, and also a lot of participants to the Olympic Games. I think there is no place where we could go and not to be reminded of a former great athlete that, uh, of your country. So I think it's important to understand, uh, to connect those two fields, to create the required mechanisms both at European level as well as national level in order for the two levels to, to obtain unity and to create what is better for ourselves, that is integrating youth on the label, uh, labor market. I shall refer to the Romanian situation. Governmentally, in Romania, not only the Ministry of Youth and Sports handles the youth, 
It is true that we try, but we don't fully succeed. Requirements for the youth are many. They're objective focused, and we never treated an objective for youth. We treated it as an objective requirement that our society needs. More than that. On the government level, the Ministry of National Education handles the youth as well, which carries out programs related to university studies and also pre-university studies because we are interested in a quality education. With a quality education, we shall Atâția și atâția ani plecând de la învățământul universitar și, bineînțeles, integrarea acestor ani de important să regăsim tine la locuri de muncă pentru exact în domeniul în care s-au pregătit. Și cred că acesta este ar putea reprezenta un obiectiv pentru fiecare dintre noi. Mai mult de atât, la nivel guvernamental, on a government level, in related to youth, uh, is also handled by the work ministry so that they can find uh, their place in society. Another very important field that can also be achieved through sports. But also in the meetings of the youth, are the disadvantaged areas Stat în parte are probleme când vorbim despre tineri din zone defavorizate. Nu cred că există stat la ora actuală, fie că vorbim de statele membre ale Uniunii Europene, fie că vorbim de celelalte întâlnim în fiecare stat zone defavorizate, tineri în zonele defavorizate, și acolo ar trebui să ne axăm mult, mult mai mult. Ceea ce faceți dumneavoastră astăzi este un lucru extrem, extrem de important. Dar și ceea ce ați făcut până acum, iar pentru asta, pentru modul în care vă implicați, fie în dezbateri, fie în ideile pe care dumneavoastră ni le propuneți pentru a lua decizii la nivel nivelul Comisiei Europene, la nivel de stat, România sau celelalte state, este un lucru extrem de important. Va trebui în continuare tot prin dumneavoastră să fiți o forță, pentru că dacă veți fi o forță, cu siguranță că și pe noi, cei care suntem astăzi și avem decizia, vom lua împreună cele mai bune direcții, astfel încât pe tine să-i putem ajuta. So important that we can help the young people. It is important that in the future we will continue the dialogue, a permanent dialogue, so that you keep finding the right solutions because you know them best because you are the young people. Because you have daily activities involving young people. Or no matter what you are doing, you can do this as well. Ministerul so Tineretului și Sportului, cât și Guvernul României, well se apleacă asupra problemelor dumneavoastră și sunt convins că împreună Comisia Europeană, Uniunea Europeană, România, pentru că deține președinția, vă sunt alături. În final, nu vreau decât atât. Să vă rog să fiți la fel de implicați și nu în ultimul rând să vă felicit pe toți cei care ați contribuit la organizarea acestui eveniment frumos și cu permisiunea dumneavoastră aș vrea să-i aplaudăm pe toți cei care s-au implicat în acest frumos eveniment. Can you please rise those who got involved in this event? I think it's important that people should know who were those if they are here because some of them might be running around doing different other things. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you've seen probably something like seven, eight. Uh, no, the team is much, much bigger, but clearly they have things to do around. 
Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Matei, for your in, uh, introductory speech. Now we're going to move on because uh, we, we've seen the, uh, the message from the European level and the message from the national level when it comes to the authorities. Now we're going to move to another uh, intergovernmental organism but which has a very, very strong influence in youth sector. Uh, and that is the Council of Europe, which is not the European Council. Okay, it's probably known as uh, the Human Rights Council, more like. Uh, and uh, it's been active since 1960s in the youth field, and they developed quite a lot of things in terms of youth policies, youth research, youth work, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, we have here together today with us uh, Ms. Antje Rutmond, head of the youth unit in the Council of Europe. Um, and uh, I would like to kindly ask you, because I know that for the time being you are trying to move forward the youth sector and you are developing in the Council of Europe a strategy dedicated for youth sector uh, with a horizon for 2030. So can you please let us know what are the plans of the Council of Europe with that strategy and how do you foresee that it will impact young people and the youth sector? Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind invitation and thank you very much for being here for your questions and it's uh, really a great honor for me to be able to share also what we do on the Council of Europe level in terms of youth strategy for the future and for the present. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar with the Council of Europe, uh, this year we actually celebrate our 70th anniversary of the organization. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you know that we are the organization with the European Court on Human Rights uh, in Strasbourg. We have 47 member states covering the whole continent, so we are big but poor, but we are nice. Uh, and our Youth for Democracy program aims to uh, support young people in upholding, promoting, defending and enjoying human rights, democracy and the rule of law wherever they live uh, and whatever their background. Um, the Council of Europe Youth Sector Strategy 2030 is presently being written. It's uh, being written in a collaborative process uh, by the governmental representatives of the ministries in charge of youth and the representatives of the youth organizations that are deciding commonly about our priorities in uh, what we call the Joint Council on Youth. So it's not ready yet because we are still working with it. Nevertheless, I am able to share with you a couple of the main lines and it's actually uh, the moderator asked me to give the three big headlines, but actually there are four, so my apologies. So there are four big headlines and I didn't want to uh, forget one or uh, om omit one. So there are four big thematic lines that the Council of Europe Youth Sector wants to follow uh, in the 10 years to come. And none of them will be a big surprise to you because, in fact, it's a continuation of what we have been doing uh, in the last uh, 50 years. You, you mentioned it uh, in the youth sector, but, of course, adapted to what's happening in Europe today. So the first headline is revitalizing pluralist democracy because Europe is not all in order. There are things to do. Um, we have uh, some big challenges on the political level, populism, nationalism, corruption, poverty, uh, racism, the threat to freedom of expression and the freedom of uh, association which we would like to address through this um, um, revitalizing pluralist democracy uh, headline. The second is young people's access to rights, to human rights, to social rights, and that's of course at the core of a social uh, of all human rights organizations like the Council of Europe. The third headline is peaceful and inclusive societies. Social cohesion has been mentioned before. And of course, uh, we would like to involve in particularly also young people that are uh, less um, 
uh, uh, apt to access their social and human rights in Europe. And the question of peace is actually a question that young people find more and more important because peace uh, is something that has become a bit old-fashioned and evident and people don't necessarily uh, think about it anymore as something to aspire. Uh, and this is exactly the moment where we have to make sure that it's not forgotten that this European cooperation is most of all and first and foremost also a peace project. And last but not least, uh, youth work and non-formal learning, which is at the core of our work, uh, and the Council of Europe has uh, recently uh, sort of uh, been speeding up uh, on promoting youth work uh, items, in particularly the training and education of youth workers on voluntary and on professional and paid level. And these are the subjects that we were uh, we identified with the young people and uh, the ministries uh, uh, together uh, as the most important. We do our work by supporting civil society, youth work, youth policy and youth research with capacity building programs in our European youth centers in Strasbourg and in Budapest, which are homes for, for our values and uh, reference points uh, with grants from our European Youth Foundation to support projects run by young people, for young people, and last but not least, and very importantly, also through our long-standing cooperation in the youth partnership uh, with the European Commission. And uh, I would like to end by saying that in the Council of Europe Youth Sector, we believe that young people should uh, be involved in all matters that concern them, and actually, it is very difficult to find any matter which does not concern young people, either today or tomorrow. This is why we promote youth participation through uh, co-management as a best example of good governance at all levels, local, national, and international. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to our discussions. Thank you very much, Ms. Rothmund. Uh, I would like now, because we are going to have also some interaction with social media, and we can also uh, preface that. Uh, those who like and agree with the four priorities, the three plus one priorities that were mentioned, can you give them a like if you are in, uh, in aligned with them? Just to have a quick check. Yes, we're good, we're good, we're there. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, now uh, we're going to move uh, towards uh, the final uh, speaker uh, uh, that we have today, and then we'll start the Q&A session. Uh, because it's important we're talking about youth. You cannot talk about youth without talking about young people. Uh, and uh, you cannot uh, talk about young people. You, a bit earlier, I mentioned that the Council of Europe probably is known about the human rights, but probably the European Youth Forum is known for youth rights or preserving the youth rights. Therefore, uh, we have uh, today with uh, us Ms. Karina Otong. Ottenburger from uh, uh, the European Youth uh, Forum, the president of the European Youth Forum. And in order to finish in a, in a round way, I'm going to ask you the same question that we started with. In the current setting that we have in Europe, which do you think are the three key priorities for the young people when it comes to the future of Europe, but in order to be active now? Thank you. Um, good morning, dear Commissioner, uh, dear Minister for Youth, dear Antje, uh, dear Youth Delegates, uh, and dear Directors General for Youth. I'm very honoured and pleasant uh, to be here today as well and to present three of the ideas or three of um, the visions that young people have for, for Europe as well. I'm sure that there are way more and I think we can also see with the youth goals that there are way more visions that young people um, have for Europe, but I will stick to the three as I was uh, requested as well by the moderator. <laughs> so the first vision that young people have for Europe is that we will envision a Europe that is sustainable. Secondly, we also envision a Europe where our voices are being heard and where the voices of everyone are being heard. And thirdly, uh, we envision a Europe of, um, of European values um, as well. And let me start with the priority that cannot wait until tomorrow. 
a sustainable Europe. A sustainable Europe requires actions today and also needs commitment today from all of us. Around 1,250 days ago, the European Union committed itself to achieve the Sustainable Development Agenda, Agenda 2030. Three and a half years later, if we look at where we are standing right now, in some areas we notice that we're actually worse off than where we have started. And one of them is combating inequalities. 21.8 million young people in the European Union are living at the risk of poverty or social exclusion. That is almost one in every three young people. One in three. But how can we fix these numbers? How can we make sustainable development a reality? And also, how can we ensure that sustainable development is part of our policy discussions, of all of them? And it is clear for us that we need an overarching sustainable development strategy with clear targets and a clear plan to action as well. But this one happened by magic. This one happened by accident, but it also requires a coordinated plan and clear targets as well to achieve this goal. And for months now, we've seen young people gathering across the globe to demand climate justice. From Athens to Brussels, from Porto to Cluj, young people have been on the streets demanding to have our voices being heard and our rights to be fulfilled. I've participated myself in the climate march in Brussels as well, and I can tell you how empowering it is to stand up together with the young people and to demand that our rights are being uh, fulfilled and that our voices is being heard. But it's also up to politicians now to take these voices and ensure that this is going to be implemented as well and that really something is changing as well. And this brings me to my second point. A Europe where all voices are heard. We know that through the climate marches that we see all across the globe, all across Europe, that young people are making their voice heard. But we also do this by being active in youth organizations, in youth clubs. This is our way of making our voices heard. And young people are also active online. This is our way. This is how we make our voices heard. But how can we ensure that these voices are being heard as well, like by policymakers? How can we extract what young people are saying and ensure that it's being followed up? And I've said it before, and I think I, I'm going to say it again as well. Uh, the solution is that we need to go where young people are. Politicians, but also us as youth representatives, we need to go where we find young people. We need to go to the streets and talk. Go into the youth clubs and youth organizations and talk. We need to be present online and talk and engage in real dialogue. And we also know that young people feel most comfortable to speak up, to share our views when we feel safe in our environment. And usually we feel safe and comfortable in the environment that we're used to. It's in schools, it's in youth organizations. It's in environments where we find ourselves in a daily way. So this is where we need to go and grasp the ideas and views of young people as well. It won't simply work if we tell young people to go out and vote. Politics doesn't work like this. So it's important that we meet young people halfway and ensure that we really like gather their views, ensure that our voices are being heard as well. And this grassroots, the citizen-led movements that we see all across Europe, all across the globe, this is the new form of political participation. This is what our generation has decided to do. This is how we decided to engage in policies. This is how we want to shape policy processes. This is how we want to be heard. And that's why it's so important that policymakers, that politicians, recognize this form of participation and actually meet young people where we are active as well. However, we also know that this active engagement and interest of us young people that we have would be lost if there is no political follow-up. It will lead to frustrations. That's why it's important that policymakers, that politicians engage with us. So let's agree to go there. Let's agree to go where young people are and let's make it happen. And finally, a third message that I want to bring here today is that young people want a Europe of European values. Values are at the heart of our Europe, and it's the heart of Europe that drives the project forward to something that young people can be proud of. Fundamentally, we must stand up for human rights, equality and justice. 
without the bedrock, without a solid foundation, everything that is built on top of it is, will be sinking. It won't solve anything. But we also know that such an undertaking cannot be done alone. It's a collective task for younger and older generations, for small and big countries, for governments and for citizens. And when our democracies are at risk, we cannot afford to remain silent. And we must not stay silent. We were just hearing about the great work that the Council of Europe is, for instance, doing for the rights of young people all across Europe. But we also know that the Council of Europe is currently under severe threat as well. And it's our task as well to stand up for the values of the Council of Europe and to protect it. We need to stand up for human rights, for democracy and the rule of law in all European countries. This is a pledge we make to each other. The governments will stand up to breaches of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. And citizens will hold you accountable in ensuring that your pledge is being realized. I think that these three topics, sustainable development, participation of all citizens and European values are the top three priorities for young people currently in Europe, but not only for young people, it should be also the priority for Europe itself, if the project is to continue and to thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I think it would be fair and square. We already know the drill. Do you agree with the three key messages that has been sent by the European Youth Forum? Yes, I can see that we do. Wonderful, brilliant. It seems that uh, we have a consensus here. Now we're going to move on to the Q&A session and now allow me also to, to join our, uh, our guests here. Uh, before that, uh, just uh, a few introductory notes. First of all, uh, we're going to now start what is called the citizen dialogue. Uh, and uh, we have uh, around 250 citizens from all over Europe here uh, that are coming is, uh, is either from the youth sector, because we have the youth representatives, either from the authorities, either from the international organization, and that is an important role, but now I'd like to, you to kindly step up in your citizen role as well. Um, and I would like also to, to mention that there are not only people from European Union here, but also from the countries neighboring the European Union, because, well, European Union is a, a, uh, well, a concept that is in a continuous development. Uh, and there are, we are more than welcoming them as well. Secondly, uh, this Q&A session is not going to happen only with the citizens in this room, but uh, will allow also uh, whoever would like to intervene to do it via the social media uh, channels that we have. So if you are interested in order to, uh, to interact with our four guests here, uh, there are two posts on the Facebook and our Twitter of the EU Youth Conference and there you can also address questions. So whoever is seeing us out there uh, in, a, in a virtual way, just know that you are also uh, taken on board and more than welcome to come up with questions. And of course, I guess also in this room, there might be some people who know somebody, so don't be, sh don't be shy and send, pass on the message. Last but not least, in order, we would like to take as many questions as possible and we're going to have roughly around one hour to do that. Um, but in order to do that, I uh, would like to kindly ask you to, uh, to follow three main principles. First of all, from the time-wise point of view, either if you have a comment or a question, try to, try to manage it to do it, to put it in 30 seconds, maximum one minute. Also, uh, because you are the rock stars, and you are the rock stars, I'm pretty sure that you know the rock stars, they have to, 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 st to stick to a very tight schedule. We're going to kindly ask also the speakers here to try to answer in maximum two minutes, so we'll have time for as many questions as possible. Secondly, I kept hearing also here and also during the last two days about the importance of having a constructive dialogue, and this is what we'd like to have. We can agree to disagree, that's not a problem. What we'd like to have here is, however, a constructive dialogue. 
Therefore, maybe some of the people were there yesterday in the workshop for um, art of uh, dialogue. And you know that there are two key principles to be followed. First of, one, first of all is listen with attention, and then you talk, talk with intention. So please try to follow also this principle. And last but not least, and then we're going to, uh, to start the Q&A session, please try to stick to youth-related matters, because this is a panel about young people and youth. Do we agree? Do we have an agreement? Uh, I would like to also, yes. Okay, it seems that we do. Perfectly. Then uh, we have the microphones ready, therefore, now it's the time for you to speak up and ask whatever you want and whatever you are curious to find out from our four wonderful speakers in front of you here. So we have a question over here. And please address it, I mean, be very clear also towards to whom you are addressing the question. Yeah, that's also very important. Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning. Andreas Novakovic, uh, Consiliul Tinerilor Instituționalizați, Council of Institutionalized Youth in Romania. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, we have a real uh, big issue with housing for children and, and youngsters who uh, grew up in the social protection system and have nowhere to go. What's the policy for housing? And if there is one, can you please have us involved? involved in the dialogue because we are 57,000 in this beautiful country that needs help. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Mr. Navracic. Yeah, we'll take, I mean, answer after each question. Yes, uh, unfortunately there's no such as, as European housing policy. We have some financial instruments for uh, supporting uh, national government schemes, regional funds, cohesion funds, uh, and uh, there are some special projects for rural areas, for instance, or mountainous areas, I mean, remote and mountainous areas. But uh, the housing policy as such at European level uh, doesn't exist at the moment. Probably in the future there will be some, some social aspects and there might be new projects in that as well. Okay, and I guess only the youth strategy leaves room for that because it's quite generous also from this point of view. Okay, thank you very much for your question. A second question. Okay, we have the citizen over there in the back. And please state also your name, your country. Um, yes, hello. I'm Ismail Pai Civico. Uh, I come from Youth for Action and Standing International. Um, and it's mainly a question directed towards Mr. Navrasic, but also to Mr. Matei. Because I heard that he was speaking about creating more opportunities and getting people into university. But forgetting the people that maybe they have other vocations, other motivations, and other needs in life or other types of employment that maybe don't need this kind of uh, educational systems. For example, I'm talking about constructions or bakery or cooking or gardening or these kind of, uh, of other kind of uh, employment that people can still get a bright future in those. And I think we're forgetting these people that we don't necessarily need. Uh, I mean, there is enough programs for students uh, within the European Union. Uh, to get them a brighter future, but I think we're forgetting some parts of the youth because in this case we're speaking about everyone and not just one part of the privileged people within the European Union. So I'd like a comment on that. Uh, yeah, so Mo, question main, okay, sorry, yeah, I forgot the question. Uh, <laughs> what do you think could be done in this aspect and what can actually be done and implemented but like realistically and not just giving a few speeches once in a while, what can concrete information on what we can do for these, let's say, not unprivileged, but not the, this group of people that we don't really think about as much. Okay. Mr. Navracic? First, um, at European level, what we can do is, uh, is a mutual recognition of, of um, uh, different certificates of skills in education. And we, if we identify all those skills taught in, in schools or even in, in higher education or in, in, in the forms of non-formal education as a relevant skills, for instance, uh, social skills or entre entrepreneurial skills, uh, member states can be encouraged to, to recognize all those skills and to put them into the national curricula. We are just launching the European Education Area Projects, which uh, 
which uh, aims at uh, creating um, an open European education area by 2025, which means that uh, we would like to penetrate the whole vertical of the education uh, system from the preschool education up to the higher, higher education uh, with new aspects, with new uh, criteria and um, new and more um, and a closer cooperation between the member states. So probably uh, if there are special demands uh, for, you, you mentioned Estonia, was it? Belgium. Uh, Belgium, sorry. Uh, uh, um, so probably if, uh, if there is an initiative coming from the member states to, to make these forms of education and those skills taught in, in, in the education mutually recognized by the other member states, we can encourage and, uh, and support the member states to do that in the future. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Matei. I think the question was also addressed to you. And if you have other questions in the middle, please raise your hands and we can, okay, over there, if the microphone can, could, could go over there. Da, yeah, please. Yes, it is important. a very important uh, field, Romania, actually. In Romania, the Ministry of National Education has opened the possibility to set up vocational schools again. This is actually what we mean. It is extremely important to have an education system that would produce what you are saying. And for that, in Romania, in the past few years, uh, 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 și mai mult de atât, avem un program de dotare a acestor școli profesionale. Pentru că dacă ne dorim să avem într-adevăr profesioniști adevărați, aceștia trebuie să se desfășoare procesul instructiv, educativ și în condiții foarte bune. Cred că acesta este primul pas. Dar mai departe, cred că împreună va trebui să găsim mecanismele necesare astfel încât pe acestea să integrăm în piața forței de muncă. Mulțumesc frumos! Thank you very much. I would just like to add, I mean, there was a very interesting idea that came up during the conference because you are talking about an education uh, area, but there was also a European education area, but there was also mentioned the importance of maybe creating a European youth area as well, maybe something to, to reflect upon. Yes, we have a question, question over, over there. Hi, um, my name is Kelvin, Kelvin Akpelu, I'm from Irish Youth Delegates. And um, my question is, um, goes to uh, um, uh, the, youth for, um, the youth forum and also the European, uh, the Council of Europe. Um, you talked about inclusion and um, engaging of young people and also in decision making. Um, and I want to say how inclusive, um, because um, there is other younger people in, in, in Europe um, talking about uh, when I when I talk about Europe I mean there is other black other black European youth um, who has um, needs or the needs to and um, other um, when you talk about let's say um, European youth from also different cultures different ethnic groups and um, there are certain events for example I'm very privileged to be here and when I when I looked around when it comes to decision making um, um, I'm the only I would say African um, black person here, or maybe another one too. But um, when it comes to inclusive and decision making, I think if we have, what are you doing in including other young people like us or around our ethnic groups? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Which apparently is welcomed by the crowd as well. So Karina, would you like to open? So I think from the European Youth Forum's perspective, I think there are mainly two actions of area. One is, of course, like to look at our internal structures. So we ha how we work as a platform, how we work as an organization as well. And for instance, last year we had an expert group of, consisting of member organizations who were specifically working on the topic of, of inclusivity as well. And like to ensure that all young people can participate um, as well. We also had, for instance, specifically last, in the last few years, we were focusing on young asylum seekers, young refugees, for instance, uh, also because they belong main, often back to this group as well, like of minority groups as well. And there we were producing guidelines for youth organizations as well, like on how they can open up the structures as well and ensure that internally in structures as well that are already in place, 
all young people can actively participate as well, and not only uh, on topics, for instance, a refugee on migration, but also uh, on sustainability, on employment. So right, really ensure that they can fully participate as well. But we also were focusing on issues such as disability. Uh, so like really like on inclusion from a, from a broader perspective. But of course, externally, it's also a big issue that we communicate this as well and ensure that programs where young people can participate actively are also accessible. So for instance, when we speak about Erasmus+, Plus, here we know it's a very positive program as well, but we need to make it more accessible as well, like for diverse groups of uh, young people. And as the commissioner was rightfully saying before, that's why it's so important to link it with other existing funding programs as well, who can support, for instance, young people in the local environment and prepare them, for instance, to go abroad. Uh, but also, like, as I was mentioning before in my speech as well, that, that actually politicians go as well, like, to uh, different areas where these young people are, uh, that we have consultations as well, like, in areas where these young people find themselves. So, like, really, like, to have this active approach as well and not wait until these young people are coming to us as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Antje? Uh, thank you, Kellen, for this, this question. I put my stopwatch on because I'm afraid that I will speak too long on that one because that is uh, definitely one of the questions that's most important also in the Council of Europe youth sector to involve young people uh, from different ethnic backgrounds, uh, from uh, not only different uh, social backgrounds uh, through our programs. And I think uh, what, what we have been preaching and also promoting uh, for decades is nothing about young people without young people. And that is also very true uh, for uh, young people from minorities uh, or from different uh, backgrounds. Uh, so we are inviting uh, Roma young people, people uh, with refugee or migrant background, uh, people of different, uh, young people of different ethnic, cultural and social origin around the table. We do this by offering special programs, but also we are trying to uh, foster the creation of organizations uh, which represent them. So there are quite a number of organizations of um, migrant refugees, uh, refugees, Roma, young people that have been created on the Council of Europe uh, youth sector's basis uh, and uh, in, our, in our activities. But having said that, I think yeah, you, you are right. There is still a lot more to do. Uh, and uh, we have to do this also in cooperation with uh, our partners outside of Europe. I think this is very important. And that is definitely uh, one of the areas which we have been neglecting a little bit. Uh, the North-South dialogue is uh, an option uh, for that, but also uh, the cooperation in the, in the Mediterranean basin is important, the Euro-Arab dialogue. Uh, but with Black Africa, for example, we haven't had uh, really um, intensive programs recently. So I think uh, it's something that we should revitalize uh, also on European level uh, to, uh, uh, to also uh, help from that side. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Antje. We have a question over there. And do we have, I mean, if you have other questions, yeah, if you can also have a mic after that, we'll take that question. Yes, it's good to have also some gender balance. So please, Maria. Thank you, I'm Maria from the Spanish Youth Council. As we pointed out yesterday, one every three pe young people in Spain uh, live at risk of poverty and social exclusion. That's a general situation all around Europe. So I wonder, well, I would ask to the Council of Europe, European Commission, and also to the European Youth Forum about one measure or one thing that could be done to tackle this situation. Okay, one measure. Who would like to start with one measure? Okay, Mr. Navracic. What we can do is, uh, is giving more opportunities for young people by doubling the budget of Erasmus in the next uh, seven years long uh, budget of the European Union starting uh, in 2021, which uh, means that we can increase the per capita funding for the individual mobility schemes. And uh, mobility, taking 
part of, uh, of Erasmus projects, going abroad, study abroad, can give more opportunities for young people to get out from, from severe situation or, 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 um, or a poor environment. And uh, probably that could be one more incentive to, to tackle this situation. In the long term, I would say that more education and more employment can be the, the, the most beneficial remedies of, of that situation. Okay, thank you very much. So more mobility. Anyway, in the panel yesterday, I would like to stress there are also some people speaking on behalf of the future Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps. And besides more mobility, it was stressed the importance of have less bureaucratic uh, measures in order to increase the accessibility of the young people. So Antje? Well, thank you for this question. I think poverty is one of the um, biggest threats to democratic stability. And so within the Council of Europe, we are discussing that also in the framework of uh, solidarity and equal distribution of, of what's there. There is a big wealth in Europe, but it's not equally distributed. So uh, the equal distribution of wealth and solidarity uh, is, I think, one of the measures that we, we should promote. And that goes along with, for example, fighting corruption. Uh, which is uh, a big uh, threat also to, to uh, uh, democracy because uh, money is going there where it should not go. And uh, that is, I think, a very important measure also to take. And in the Council of Europe, you might know we have the uh, larger anti-corruption uh, body and also monitoring of anti-corruption measures. So one way to fight poverty is also to fight corruption. And thank you very much for that. Karina. Yeah, I think um, poverty and uh, social exclusion is very often linked as well, like with the labor market. Um, of course, if you don't have access to a quality job or a job at all, you're also, it's very likely that you're also faced with uh, poverty or social exclusion as well. And now we also know that the European Union is negotiating at budget priorities as well. And what we notice in general, there is a trend of uh, saying that youth unemployment is decreasing, which is a reality, but proportionally, it's still like very much high in comparison if you compare it uh, to other age groups as well. And that's why it's important that it remains a priority as well, like on EU level as well. And also that there is funding available made and when it comes to ESF plus to really ensure that youth unemployment is remaining an issue as well. And I think this is one of the topics where we need to push for and not that it's kind of like washed away with a different narrative that there is growing numbers of employment. So I think this is a very strong focus where we need to remain strong and really ensure that there is funding earmarked uh, for the upcoming years as well, because this is something where we need long-term solutions as well. This is not a solution or something that we can solve within a couple of days, but we need their commitment as well, and commitment requires funding as well. Thank you very much. I think we have a question over there. Uh, hello, I'm coming from the National Youth Council of Bulgaria and my question is to Mr. Matei. My question for you is more broader, so can you please tell for you why the structured dialogue now, EU dialogue, is important and why should be present here and now, what is its meaning, not what it's looking like right now? Okay, thank you very much. And in the meanwhile, if you can have a microphone over there, that would be great. Thank you. It is it's extremely important. important. Uh, dialogue is extremely important. As, as we started, uh, also in the answer to my, the first question that was for me, uh, the dialogue with youth uh, only takes us to solutions. It only generates solutions. Only by, uh, through this dialogue, you can give us the solutions so that we can try to solve some of the problems that you are dealing with. Cu siguranță nu vom reuși să le rezolvăm pe toate, dar sunt convins că acest dialog pe care îl avem cu dumneavoastră nu poate fi unul decât constructiv. Și iată că probabil că și acest dialog cu dumneavoastră unde au fost identificate foarte multe probleme a dus și la o dublare, dacă pot să spun așa, celui mai important program care se dublează și cel mai cunoscut la nivelul Uniunii Europene este vorba de Erasmus. Programul Erasmus Plus, după cum bine știți, a fost, este și sunt convins că va rămâne unul dintre cele mai de succes programe care nu face nimic altceva. 
decât duce la a ne cunoaște, a ne înțelege și de ce nu a stabili priorități și obiective comune. Mulțumesc frumos! Hi, I'm um, Marius from Germany. My question goes to both you, Mr. Navracic, and to Karina. Um, before starting, I, I, I heard you were saying that you're glad to be here with the, uh, the future. I just want to state once again, we would like to be the present, uh, but sometimes it's a bit difficult not to have access to be the present because we're ready to act already. Um, I'm also very happy for Karina having mentioned values as uh, something fundamental uh, in the European Union. Um, in Article 2 of the European Treaties, the values that we as the European Union want to defend are very well mentioned. Uh, one of those values is um, the human rights, respect to human rights. And when we look to human rights, we know that human rights should be universal. So everyone, no matter of their race, of their uh, religion, of their sexual orientation, should have access to those uh, human rights Now, uh, I want to draw the attention to the situation in the Mediterranean, where at the moment, or where in the past 15 years, more than 25,000 people have died passing the Mediterranean. Um, and just yesterday, the European Union announced that uh, it will stop sending ships uh, on their rescue missions. So at the moment, after having criminalized civil sea rescue, that was only uh, happening because uh, there was no state uh, sea rescue, the European Union will now only have drones actually um, surveilling the Mediterranean. Um, so my question to you, Mr. Navracic, is as a um, commission on youth, I believe you should be the front person to protect the rights of young people, uh, all young people um, in Europe. Um, so my question is, what did you do to protect those young people uh, that died in the Mediterranean trying to come here? And my question to you, Karina, is what are the um, demands of the European Youth Forum when it comes to uh, sea rescue? Okay. Who would like to start, Mr. Navracic? Yes, uh, well, I, in my understanding, that doesn't mean that uh, any life-saving activities will be accomplished on the Mediterranean Sea. There will be, a, I would say, a business as usual, so there will be emergency situations, and if there are emergency situations, it will be solved by the member states' fleets. So there will be still border patrol and, and all, all, all those activities which are necessary to, to keep uh, the Mediterranean Sea safe. The, uh, the difference is that there is no emergency situation in the Mediterranean Sea because the influx of the migrants or refugees are much lower than it used to be previously or it was even one year ago. I mean, it's almost one-tenth of the numbers Or the refugees I just came from Italy, and they told me that uh, that now the number of uh, of uh, of refugees uh, arriving at uh, the southern part of Italy is much less than it was even even uh, a few months before. So I think this uh, this decision it just symbolizes the fact that the emergency situation is over, temporary or or finally. I I simply can't say it. But, uh, but there are fleets and there are ships and they can save uh, the lives of, of those people who are, in, who are in trouble. Thank you. Karina? So, yeah, in the European Youth Forum, we have been working uh, for a couple of years on the topic of migration as well. And we support safe passage as well because we also believe that we need to represent and speak up for all young people, no matter of their legal background, as long as they're, you know, as soon as they are in Europe as well. So, this is very important uh, for us as well. So, we have a clear message as well. Uh, and uh, I think this is a very important uh, matter as well because we cannot discriminate young people regardless, regarding their background. Uh, and we also need to ensure that they're protected and especially when they're in such vulnerable situations as well, when they're forced to leave their countries, when they're forced to leave their homes and lose everything, we need to be there for these young people more than ever. Thank you. Yes, we have a question over there and then another one over here. Uh, and I would like to kindly remind also uh, the people who are watching us uh, through the uh, social media channels Once again, you're more than welcome to put your questions as well, and my colleague Rooks will more, be more than happy to transmit them to, to us. And if we can have also a microphone in the meanwhile over there. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Azza Cherwani. I'm the youth delegate from Sweden. This question is for the council and the commissioner. 
uh, we're talking about European values, the European culture of creating a European society in which we all feel part of the European family and community, but at the same time, in nation after nation, in Sweden, in Germany, in, in France, we have a growing number of sons and daughters of migrants who have fled. Could be war, could be other types of crises, who are dealing with a transnational and transcultural clash of identity, of not feeling part of the Swedish culture, part of the German culture, or part of the European culture. It is affecting the youth in particular because it affects our belief, our trust in democracy. Me, myself, I grew up in a pretty rough suburb just north of central Stockholm called Rinkeby, and I didn't actually feel part of the Swedish community until I was at the age of 15. Every, every time someone asked me where I was from, I would, I would say Kurdistan when they were asking where in Stockholm I lived. I'm, I'm questioning what exactly, what measures are we doing, what measures are we taking into creating an inclusive society in member states when it comes not only to refugees who came in near time, but people such as myself, my brother, my sister, who's grown up in Sweden, in Ireland. What are we doing to create a, an inclusive European system and culture for everyone who lives and grows up here and not happens to be white? Thank okay. you. So back to action and concrete measures. Yes, thank you very much. So who would like to start? Yes, Antje. But I, uh, thank you. I, I'd like to put a question back to you. I mean, what happened to you where you say you were 15 and you didn't feel Swedish but, or European and now you do? So something must have happened so that things have changed. And this is exactly why we are working with people like you <laughs> who can help us in finding ways of furthering integration. So in the Council of Europe we have, for example, one project which is called ENTER, uh, which was particularly aimed to young people into sub in suburbs of big cities and how to involve young people. And we involved young people to develop very concrete measures. I, I would sort of be too long now to explain uh, and projects in these areas to help uh, young people to integrate uh, from, from different cultural backgrounds. The, another thing is, is, I think we have to think about what we talk about when we talk about culture. And culture is something which is not a static measure. Culture is changing all the time. Culture is something that uh, changes with the ownership of the people that feel for it. So probably feeling ownership or feeling European today means something different than it meant 50 years ago. The same is true for feeling Swedish today might be something different than 50 or 60 years ago. So we are all part of uh, developing this culture and that is, I think, a question of history teaching, which is a program that we run as well to understand our history and also those of the others. Uh, we also have these beautiful projects of cultural roots where we also see that actually the influence of other cultures than European in Europe is a long-standing fact. I mean, it's not something that happened in the last 10 years. I mean, there was always this exchange of cultures of different continents. And to recall this into the uh, conscience of people, I think it's one important step. And then, of course, involving people like you who made this transition, uh, as advisor, I think that is one uh, very important measure that we take. Okay, thank you. So uh, the speakers are citizens as well, so they're also allowed uh, to put questions. Therefore, what happened to you? I was not expecting this, but um, <laughs> for me personally, well, the one thing was I moved away. That was one thing. My family happened to grow a business, so we moved into a very white military area, north of Stockholm. And uh, the question was no longer put into which country did you come from, but where, which geographic location in Stockholm do you live in? Another thing that is quite important is uh, the, the feeling of exclusion in society. When politicians, for instance, were speaking of including uh, different cultural backgrounds, they weren't speaking it to us. It's about looking around in this room and not seeing that many people of Middle Eastern background representing their nations. Same in parliamentary sessions, not just in European, but also national. But I think most of all, it is when we make programs such as the Erasmus, which is an amazing program, we do it from the perspective of 
homogenic societies of, of the population that actually has resided in the nation for a long time. I personally did not even hear of the Erasmus Plus program because there was no information given to us in Inkibi. I think we need to include more uh, work in there and the dissolution of segregated areas. But that, as the Commissioner so well put, is not something the European Union currently is working with, which I personally think they should. But I'm just wondering more, what specific actions are we taking right now to include people of Middle Eastern, African, other types of origins? Okay. Let me not much. agree with you. Let me not agree with you, because Erasmus is definitely not designed for homogeneous societies. The biggest part of, of Erasmus projects is, uh, is designed for heterogeneous societies. We have a lot of projects, uh, language teaching uh, courses or, or uh, social integration, social inclusion, sports uh, social inclusion uh, projects. We also have awards for social integration via sports activities and NGO uh, sports, uh, grassroots sports NGOs. Uh, but th those projects are on offer. It's up to the member states up to the local NGOs, up to the authorities, up to the, up to the schools, which they prefer, which projects, and they apply for them or they don't apply uh, for those projects. So the European Union is not a super state. We can, we can encourage member states, and even in my portfolio, I mean education, culture, youth and sports, all parts of this, por of this portfolio belong to the so-called principle of subsidiarity, which means that it's the exclusive competence of the member states. And I, think the, I simply don't want to put the blame on, on the member states' shoulders, because it's, now it's not their blame. We have to work together, but it's not easy to identify uh, contemporary challenges, because there are, I would say, I would say situational challenges, and there are eternal or more, uh, more long-lasting challenges in a society. For instance, uh, when I entered into office in, in the autumn of 2014, immediately after I, uh, I, I started to work, there were severe terrorist attacks in Brussels, in Paris, in Copenhagen, uh, and uh, we just started the so-called Paris process of the education ministers in March 2015, which identifies the critical points of the European education systems, where European education systems fail to attract young people with, with migrants' background, but they are not migrants anymore because they are two or third generation Swedes or, or French or, or Italian citizens. But uh, there must be something, I would say deficiency in the European education systems which alienate them, which let them marginalized and uh, and uh, we are working on that. There's a close cooperation. We have some results, but I know education is a long-term project always, you know. Uh, what, we, what we do now uh, probably will bring results in, in 15 years or in 10 years, but we have to start now. And uh, Erasmus, I think it is a, it's definitely um, supposed to be a flexible framework for the ever-changing environment of the education system, the social integration, social inclusion, and we, we try to adjust the ever-changing uh, challenges or ever-changing ever requirements of the contemporary societies to do that. Thank you very much for, answer, for this answer. Erasmus Plus is a very important tool, however, probably we should think also whether it's enough and what else we can do. And I think this is also one of the message that has been sent during these uh, two days. Okay, we have a question over there and then we're preparing, uh, yes, we're, we're, we're starting, we have several questions, which is very good. We have two there and if uh, uh, the microphone people could go also there in the back, it'd be nice. Hello, uh, I'm Spiros Papadatos. I'm from Greece, but I'm here representing ASE, the European Students Forum, and I would like to thank you all for being here today. Um, I have a question for the Commissioner. Um, you stated, and I quote, the structured dialogue has an important role to play in this. I'm more determined than ever to reach out to one million young people during my term as Commissioner. Together, we can build an open, diverse, strong Europe. Now, um, in, we're in 2019 and we're seeing a lot of things happening in Europe. We see a member state 
willing to leave uh, the European Union. We see the rise of populism, Euroscepticism, topics that I personally think the European commissioners, especially the one on education and youth, should address more often. So I would like to ask you today, in 2019, in the end of your term, how successful do you think the European project is? And do you think it's still on the right track towards democracy, unity, and a better world? Okay, thank you. Yes, definitely. Uh, I think all those debates and all those um, negative developments or controversial developments at European level uh, signals that the European Union is just becoming a real union. Now we have common issues. Now we have conflicts. You know, the, the, the problem with the, with the European Parliament elections uh, so far has been that they were second ranking national parliamentary elections. Every member state had its own parliamentary elections uh, under the umbrella of the European Parliament elections. They had no joint challenges or common uh, topics or issues to be debated, but uh, they, uh, all the political parties just pursued their own national agendas. Now we have uh, European, pan-European political issues and conflicts, sometimes very painful, sometimes very sharp, but that's politics, look like. I mean, in, in politics, you always have uh, sharp and painful conflicts, but that's the sign for me that it's just becoming to be a political system. So I think the European integration is on the right track. Yeah, you're right. There is one member states who decided to leave the EU if they decide that, I, so. we're in limbo still. Um, but, uh, but I think that, uh, that uh, this process, sometimes painful process, uh, of uh, politicizing issues at European level, either climate change or, or global warming or the migration issue, are the, the signs of, uh, of an emerging political system at uh, European level. What, uh, what relates to my, my achievement? Well, I, I have to be modest, so I, it's up to you if, what, if, it, if this period was successful or not. I try to build uh, very good relations with the youth organizations. I try to, to, to contribute to your aspirations and try to help you in, uh, in fulfilling your lives. I hope that there was a modest contribution to your lives as well in the past five years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have the feeling that we need a bit of energy in the room. Yeah, I've seen you in a second. We're going to take a question from the back, then our coming here, then in the back, and then coming here. But I would like you to do the following thing. I would like to think of one thing, everybody, that you would like to address to any of the, of the people here. And then we're going to say it in the same time. Yes? Let's see what's going to happen. Are you ready? Yes? yes? Okay. So one phrase that you'd like to address the people here, it can be in your language as well, it doesn't really matter, just a message that you'd like to send, all together in the same time, Voice of Europe sending messages to the speakers here. Yes? Ready? Three, two, one, go! <laughs> well, I heard a very clear and loud voice. Apparently, you all, tr we all thought that you should delegate that to that voice, okay? Okay, that's fair enough. This is how this, the dialogue is working. It's uh, self-regulated. So, th thank you very much. Now, we're going to take a question from the, from, yes, from the gentleman in the back uh, side of the room. Um, hello, I'm Max. I'm uh, from the Netherlands. Um, we talked a lot about youth rights and human rights, and in the context of the future of the European Union, I think it's very, uh, a very important topic. Um, that we have, you know, at least a baseline that we all agree upon, uh, which allows us to work together. Um, recently in Romania, uh, my directions question to Mr. Minister Matei. Recently in Romania, there was a referendum on whether uh, gay marriage should be uh, should be banned. Um, and now I don't want to talk about gay marriage and whether that should be allowed. Uh, everyone has their personal opinion about that, and I can understand the cultural sensitivities around it. Um, what I want to talk about is the very toxic environment that that created, a very polarized environment where everyone was forced to take uh, a, a, a position in favor or a position against, a very toxic environment for many young people who might be struggling 
um, with their sexuality or are questioning their sexuality. My question to you, Minister Matei, is how will you, as Minister of Youth and Sports, coming from a party that capitalized on that referendum very heavily, um, how will you ensure that, um, that the, the rights of those young people, their freedom of expression, their freedom from discrimination, how will you ensure that those rights are protected and that they can grow up in a Romania that is, that is safe and stable for them as, uh, uh, as LGBTQ youth? Thank you. Mr. Matei. Thank you very much for your question. I believe you know the result of the vote, and I believe I don't need to further comment on it. The majority decides, so then I don't think there should be further commentary when we're talking about the vote. With regard to your opinion about the toxic environment, I haven't seen this toxic environment in Romania if we strictly refer to the referendum. Moving forward, Romania is a secure state and a, a state that, uh, that respects the citizen. It's a democratic state. I am part of a government, a government comprised of our partners, ALDE, and the Social Democratic Party. But if we talk about democracy in Romania, as a member state of the European Union, it shall be respected and will continue to be respected. When we talk about youth, the rights of the young people uh, have, are, and will be respected. Uh, the voice of the young people for us politics. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to take a, a question lot. from over there, and then we'll go again in the back of the room. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Milan. I'm from the Flemish Youth Council from Belgium. Um, I believe that youth participation goes further than the field of youth policy. As Karina mentioned, we care about climate change. Today, we're talking about the future of work, which is economy. I heard questions about migration. So um, two questions. The first one to Mr. Navracic. Um, how do you, as a commissioner for youth, ensure that every commissioner um, takes into account the opinions of young people in every policy area? And then the second one to Karina, do you feel like this is something that can improve? And do you feel like the um, input from the European Youth Forum is being taken seriously in every policy area? Thank you. So, who would like to start? So yeah, this is an, a very important topic for us to have youth policy both as um, horizontal as well as vertical uh, policy as well in place. As you were rightfully mentioned, like there is no issue that is not of concern or is not affecting uh, young people as well. So of course, our aim is as well like to engage with different commissioners as well and um, with different uh, well members as well like in the parliament with different groups. So kind of like to involve different actors when it comes to policy making as well. With the adoption of the last youth strategy as well, like we were also like closely, of course, working with the commission as well, and of course, closely with the commission as well. Uh, we were also like looking into idea, the idea of having a EU youth coordinator who can actually support this and ensure that all commissioners are aware of uh, youth relevant issues as well. But of course, as European Youth Forum, we're closely working as well, like already now with different commissioners as well. For instance, Commissioner Tyson, when it comes to um, employment affairs so there is a lot of uh, issues already going on now and we of course like looking into ways and how we can strengthen this in the in the future as well because we know that all of these policies are affecting young people as well and you want to have successful policies as well in all these different areas we need to ensure that we are in, involved as well so i think this is absolutely a very important uh, topic for us and we will continue uh, working on this as well together as well like with the with the commission and other partners as well to make it the a reality and i think also with the youth goals we have a great baseline now as well also given that they're mentioned uh, in the in the youth strategy also like highlighting that we need to engage with different actors uh, as well like to create a Europe where young people's rights are being fulfilled and where we can also like participate in different policy areas thank you yes indeed I uh, my my contribution could also uh, could only be a, a kind of backdrop based on personal relationship with the, with the commissioners but but you are the best and most efficient lobbyists for the youth goals uh, because they are always 
telling me, I mean, the commissioners are always telling me that, uh, that you keep them under pressure on citizens' dialogues, on, on workshops, on, on conferences. So I think the, the horizontal aspects of the youth policy and, and all those issues related to, to young people are quite well known in the, in the European Commission, and we do our best. Okay, thank you very much. Now, in the back of the room, Mihai, yes. Hello, uh, I'm Mihai, I'm part of the National Working Group from Romania, and I'm coming on behalf of the Youth Center from, uh, from Timisoara. So my question is going first uh, to, the, to the Mr. Minister and in second part to the Commissioner. So Mr. Minister, we all aware that the principle that the President of the European Youth Forum mentioned in the dialogue with young people that every voice matters and you have to meet the young people in their safe space is not currently happening in Romania. Um, so concretely, you as a Minister, what are you planning in order to open your institution in the way that uh, to reach the co-management that Council of Europe is uh, uh, um, applying. And to the Commissioner, the question is like the budget for Erasmus is increasing. Um, and I think the question is coming from behalf of the countries uh, similar with, uh, with us. Uh, the budget for Key Action 3 that is destined for dialogue with authorities at the national level, it will be increased accordingly or more because we actually need the support to discuss with authorities, at least in this part of Europe. Okay, thank you very much. Who would like to start? Mr. Matei, I think, yeah. Da, mulțumesc pentru întrebare. Yes, thank you for Patru luni și două zile de mandat, ușa mea a fost deschisă ONG-urilor, chiar și pentru dumneavoastră. Mergând mai departe, după cum bine știți, avem și un compartiment special care se ocupă de această problemă, pentru că Ministerul, așa cum a spus, are două componente tinerec și sport. Bănuiesc că îl cunoaște și pe domnul secretar de stat care se ocupă de probleme de tineret. Mergând mai departe, sunt convins că îl cunoaște și pe domnul secretar de stat care se ocupă tot pe probleme. De Tot la fel vis-a-vis -vis de uși deschise, sunt convins că dumneavoastră cunoașteți foarte bine și departamentul din cadrul Ministerului Tineretului și Sportului, dar mă ofrez doar la tineret, așa cum a spus dumneavoastră, care vă stă la dispoziție zi de zi pentru proiectele pe care dumneavoastră le derulați. Dacă doriți să facem o discuție, nu am niciun fel de problemă cu modalitatea în care dumneavoastră reușiți să accesați sumele pe care Ministerul Tineretului și Sportului le pune la dispoziția ONG-urilor sau tinerilor. Dar doar ca un simplu exemplu pe execuția bugetară de anul trecut, în comparație cu cât a oferit Ministerul Tineretului și Sportului, știți foarte bine că nu s-au reușit să se cheltuie toate sumele aferente. Așa că rugămintea mea către dumneavoastră toți care faceți parte din ONG-uri, indiferent de, de unde proveniți, este să reușiți să scrieți proiectele necesare astfel încât să cheltuiți suma care a fost alocată anul acesta pentru tineret, așa că ușa a fost deschisă, este și va rămâne întotdeauna deschisă la Ministerul Tineretului și Sportului pentru dumneavoastră tineri. Mulțumesc! Just a quick comment. I think it's not only about the funding, but it's more about the general dialogue with the institution. And I think it's fair and square because this is how the youth sector is growing. Bineînțeles că e vorba și de dialog, yes, dar sure, întotdeauna dialogul se oprește și la finanțare. Thank you. Yes. It's not fair. There was too short. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think it's very important. Well, it's, it's, at the moment, it's too early to say uh, any details about the internal structure of Erasmus. Because first we have to get uh, the budget, the double budget of Erasmus adopted uh, by, by the European Parliament and the Council. The European Commission proposes a doubling of the, of the budget. Uh, so far so good. I mean, all the member states and the European Parliament support the idea. But there's, uh, there's no uh, formal decision made yet at the moment. Uh, if we got the, the decision, we can negotiate uh, with the Parliament about the internal structure, and then we can decide uh, the concrete amounts for, for specific projects. So at the moment, I can't say anything, any, any more precise details about that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I think uh, it will, the Commission and the Parliament deserves how a big round of applause is for this initiative of offering more funds for young people, and, and, yes, and the Council as well. Yes, thank you very much for that. 
Now, of course, the next challenge comes to see how we can better uh, and more effectively use this uh, funding. We are slowly, slowly going towards the end. Uh, we're going to take three, four more questions, uh, and then we go first here, and then there, and then here, and then there. So please. Hello, my name is uh, Tanya, and I'm youth representative from Croatia. Uh, first, I wanted just to add something of uh, colleagues that were asking about Erasmus Plus programs. Um, I would like just also to share and emphasize that, for example, uh, I feel that European Union gave us, gave us a frame, like to us, to young people, to uh, make a project and to apply the projects that we think it's important. For example, in Croatia, we made a project according to Erasmus Plus program that uh, was the name Confluence of Culture, and we cooperate a lot uh, with Turkey, and also we include uh, Kurdish people. So it's on all of us here. All, even now, if we have some suggestion, we can really make together the project and apply to next deadline. It's something concrete that we can make here and apply it with Turkey, for example. Uh, next, what, what yes, I have please, a uh, question. Uh, when you ask uh, what is the question and address, what you want to say, my um, word in my head was realization, but maybe I, was, I wasn't so loud. Uh, so in Vienna, we were talking about implementation of 11 youth goals. And I would like to ask once again, uh, how it is possible uh, and what we can do uh, to a little bit uh, support uh, European countries, member states, and also young people uh, that are representatives, uh, that these youth goals are really realized in their countries. Uh, for, the I question is addressed to? Uh, I will address it uh, to Mr. Tibor Navracic. Okay. And uh, yes, in Croatia, for example, we make demand on all ministries because we are sitting in the same table with all ministries and they prepare us uh, what have they done, like how they implement all 11 your goals because it's different policies. And maybe also in the next conference, it would be very nice to hear very transparent what each country has done on this topic. Okay. And Croatia will have anyway soon the chance yes, to do that have. in a youth conference. So, Mr. Navracic? The Croatian presidency in the EU is just coming in one year. First half of, uh, of uh, 2020 will be Croatian presidency. So I think it's an excellent, it could be an excellent priority for the Croatian presidency. You can, you can put on the agenda of the Youth Council and, and we can work together at European level. We can influence, we, we, we can try to convince member states, we can push them, we can encourage them, but we, we, we only have these soft instruments to, to, to push these things uh, further. Okay, I think Arina would like to also to, to comment on that. Yes, I would like to give an, actually an, a success example, and also given that I'm myself from Austria, uh, I would like to highlight what happened there, and there the youth goals are now part of the national youth strategy as well. So I think this clearly shows as well like how member states can also take ownership of a European process as well, and like link it with a national process as well. So I think this is a very good example on how it can be, can be realized as well, and I think this is a great inspiration as well like for other member states as well, like on how it can be actually followed up on national level as well and there uh, I also see um, Ben Dad and also Andreas here who can I think also share a bit more on how the process went in Austria and uh, yeah. Okay thank you very much. Time is not necessarily our best friend usually in life and uh, this is not an exception. We'll have time for three more questions and then I'm afraid that we we'll have to close. We have a co question over there. Um, ben from FIMCUP, according to Eurobarometer, three out of four young people consider climate change to be a very, very serious problem. And almost all young people in Europe, according to Eurobarometer, consider it to be a problem. But uh, according to a UN survey, only 9% are confident that uh, politics are going to do enough to counter the crisis. So a question to the minister and to the commissioner, what are you going to do to restore, to rebuild the trust of young people into politics to counter this really se severe crisis? Okay, trust rebuilding. 
tough one, but an uh, important one, yes? Politics is what you do. If you don't believe in politics, then other people will do politics. So I think it's, it's not a gesture that the outgoing generations can make a legacy for the young generations and, and giving some gifts for you to, to make politics easier or something like that. It's your, it's your struggle. Of course, the European Union uh, had a huge contribution in, in tackling climate change. For instance, in Paris, in the Global Climate Summit, the EU was the main engine of the, of the consensus or the agreement of the, of the European countries. And we, you and me, have to do uh, at, at our levels, I mean, at European level, local level, regional level, but politics is always, you know, it's always a, a very complex game with conflicts, with consensus. You have to harness all the opportunities. You have to use all your powers, all your opportunities to reach your uh, purposes and, and we will support you. The EU supports all those young people who are, uh, who, who are, who are making efforts to tackle uh, climate change and, uh, and a brighter future. Thank you. Mr. Matei. Thank you very Am much for your question. I have a very scurt. simple answer and very brief. Get involved and you will manage to attract uh, as many people as possible to get involved in this process. And most definitely the European okay, Union so will involved, support otherwise you. Otherwise other people will get involved. We have another question there in the back and one final question over here and then we will have to close the session. And please try to make it as brief as possible. Thank you. I have a question on environmental sustainability, but uh, luckily I'm a very curious person, so I'm going to ask a second question uh, to the Commissioner. Uh, I'm Sean from Malta, and something that we're currently worried about is uh, new disruptive technologies. And currently we don't feel that there is a space, especially in, in youth dialogue, to talk about emerging tech. When I speak about emerging tech, I mostly mean technologies such as blockchain and, more importantly, artificial intelligence. This is often seen as somewhat of a skills gap issue, but it could be taken even further. Topics such as artificial intelligence can s eventually lead to a very disruptive place, especially in the economic sphere. They could be replacing several, several jobs of this generation and the next generation in, in the next 20, 30 years. What is the Commission doing to be preemptive um, in this regard? Is there anything that's happening to ensure that we can avoid the potential crisis in the next 30 years because of this technology? Thanks. Okay, thank you. The difficulty of this situation is that we, we, at the moment, we cannot forecast the emerging crisis of the future. So I, I, I'm not sure if we can avoid them. But uh, what we can do, and, and, uh, and we are doing it at European level, is uh, to, to build bridges to the business community or between the business community and the education uh, community to, to adjust the priorities of the business community and to, to give, to add the, the aspects of the education uh, committee uh, to develop common projects. We have the European Coalition for Jobs and Skills, which is a, a coalition of, uh, of youth organizations uh, business uh, people, education people in higher education, research, and so on and so forth. And we, we have uh, national coalitions in some member states. I don't know if, uh, if there uh, exists uh, in, in Malta one, but, but you can initiate it. I think it's a very useful platform to exchange ideas, to try to forecast the future developments, because it's uh, highly uncertain how what the, what the future will bring to us and uh, the constant flow of, of information, uh, these kinds of platforms can be very useful uh, in tackling these challenges. Okay. Thank you very much. And our last question over there. Just a second, please. Just before the last question, I have a message for the media representatives. We'll have in a few minutes a short media briefing, so we'll invite you to start moving your equipment in the next hall to be ready for the media briefing. We'll have maybe five minutes. Deci o să vă rog pe reprezentanții presei să începe să I will ask the representatives of the press to move your equipment because we will have a media briefing in the next room and please have your equipment prepared. Yes, sure. 
Okay. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm I'm Joanna, a Romanian youth, but I'm here as vice president of the European Confederation of Youth Clubs. I have a question and a small request as well. I have a question for the ministry uh, regarding youth work. Of course, we heard in the beginning during the speeches, youth work, youth clubs, unorganized young people, non-membered young people. What is your strategy regarding youth work? Simple as that. Simple question, short. And I also have a small, small request for the others to explain why youth work is so important and so necessary for young people. Because I feel that sometimes people hear you louder than they hear us, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. So youth work, and please try also to be brief. Da. Mulțumesc frumos. Thank you very much. I believe the question is not for the Ministry of Youth and Sports. I shall take it up as a question for the government. It's not the, our ministry that provides uh, employment for the youth. But as you all well know... Okay. No, uh, yeah, thank you, Andre. No, thank you, Andre. No. Youth work, uh, it's about uh, lucrători de tineri și modul în care se lucrează cu tineri. Ca să, da, ca să clarificăm... Uh, Atunci este în regulă. Dacă ne referim la modul de lucru cu tineri, este perfect. Și sunt de acord cu dumneavoastră. People, pe tot parcursul anilor trecuți, însă am să mă refer doar strict pe ceea ce înseamnă mandatul meu ca ministru al tineri și sportului. Așa cum am spus, cred că... O bună parte dintre as dumneavoastră said, am avut dialog, nu mă refer with, aici la un dialog, dialog pe care l-a avut ministrul tineretului și sportului direct cu reprezentanții dumneavoastră, ci un dialog pe care l-au avut colegii mei cu dumneavoastră. Iar cred că dacă acest forum se va termina foarte bine, nu se datorează numai ministerul, ci vi se datorează și dumneavoastră celor care v-ați implicat aici. Așa că cred că ăsta ar fi un model de bună practică pentru ceea ce facem noi împreună. Din acest punct de vedere, cred că suntem de acord. Este foarte adevărat că mai avem foarte mult de lucruri în acest aspect. Și cu siguranță că tot la fel împreună prin acest dialog de care tot vorbesc și prin aceste uși deschise pe care am amintit puțin mai devreme, I've reminded on earlier, will uh, settle a good part of the issues that you are dealing with. It's very true that no budget will be able to satisfy all your requirements, and we have to admit this, and I do admit this as the Minister of Youth and Sports, but what I do ensure that you this, and I do admit this as the Minister of Youth and Sports, but what I do ensure you of is that we are involved, and we listen to your issues, and we try to solve a great part of, uh, of the issues that you are dealing with. Thank you. So open doors, that's the key word, and I think there are going to be a lot of young people that will use those open doors. Yes, can we have a quick reaction from the other three guests? Why is youth work important from your perspective and from your organization's perspective? Yeah, and I don't want to start a debate because this is probably the topic of another youth conference and it could take days and days. Just the very first key message that comes into your mind. Why is youth work important? Well, young people need places outside of school, outside of family, where they can learn, where they can have fun, where they can develop skills that are not necessarily uh, available in other environments. And youth work settings will provide this. Youth organizations do, open youth work does, uh, and other spaces where young people can learn voluntarily, uh, but with a clear objective. Now, um, you know the Council of Europe has just uh, passed a very important recommendation, Committee of Ministers on Youth Work, thank you. Um, but this is uh, exactly the point. Uh, there is not even in our 47 member states, we made a, a, in the Youth Partnership a, a mapping, we don't even have a word in all member states for youth work, and we just saw it often, very often uh, confused with youth employment or even child labor, we also had that. So um, we are working on that and we have to continue because uh, we are also discussing like a right to youth work, like you have a right
right to education, a right to non-formal education offers for young people. So we're working for the access to it, for the quality, for the development of it. And uh, I think all our institutions do I think you're taking their that. messages so, as well. <laughs> uh, say thank you very much. <laughs> It's very difficult to add anything to that because that has, that's the essence. So let me, let me underline the importance of, of being a, in a community. If you, if you make a, a youth work, probably that might be the very first experience to, to be in a, in a, in a community where uh, not necessarily that all the members of the community agree in everything. And regardless of the differences, you have to achieve something jointly and i think that's that's a very important personality test and that's why youth work is, is very important and useful yeah and i mean youth work is of course a space where inclusion is happening where you meet other young people as well where you can meet without pressure that you might have from school that you might have from family or yeah in, in your private life so i think this is a very uh, crucial aspect where young people can engage, where they are empowered, where they gain skills and everything else that Antje was already uh, mentioning before not to, not to repeat. But I think in order to make this happen, we also need to ensure that the right conditions are in place. Yeah. So it requires laws that allow that these youth organizations, that youth clubs have a space, that they can actively shape society as well. So I think this is one of the very important uh, conditions as well. And of course that there is funding available as well. So these structures can actively support young people so they can develop, so they can engage with other. And I think this is also like a long-term investment. If we want to invest in inclusive societies, we need to con continue investing in these structures as well and ensure that this exchange can happen, that young people from different backgrounds can meet that otherwise would never ever meet because they go to different schools, because they live in different uh, areas of a city or in a different area of uh, on the countryside. So that's why it's really important to work that there are like really good structures in place and also like next year uh, youth work convention taking place in Germany I think this is also a great space like to further uh, develop the youth work agenda on on European level as well okay thank you thank you thank you very much it took a bit longer but when can how can we stop passion when it's such an important topic okay thank you very much and just remember the dialogue is a continuous thing now we have the chance to speak face to face but uh, all of our four guests are also available through different art, other kind of communication channels and don't hesitate to ask them and di dialogate with them uh, please don't leave the room for the time being i would just like to kindly ask our four guests thank you very much mr navrages mr matei antie karina it was brilliant to have you here it was brilliant to to be able to answer all the uh, all the questions from the citizens of Europe. I would like now to kindly ask you, I mean, uh, I know that Mr. Navracin and Mr. Mater are expected for the media moment, uh, so uh, you are more than welcome to do that. And uh, Karina and Nantia, if you can also have a seat, because uh, time is a merciless uh, actor, and it's for everybody, including for the Finnish delegation that needs to be, leave a bit earlier. Therefore, I would like to, uh, to invite, uh, to kindly ask you to step out, and to kindly ask the Romanian Youth Council and the Romanian delegation and the Finnish Youth Council and the Finnish delegation to step on the stage because now it's going to be their moment to pass on the presidency from Romania to Finland. Yeah, and, and you can warmly, well, encourage them. So the stage is all yours. Hello, dear colleagues, dear partners. Um, here we are at this moment of handover. I, I want to speak to you briefly about what happened and what we've learned from the presidency so far in Romania. Uh, I think the fact that the topic that we have debated is a result of consultations, mainly in a discussion forum, uh, organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and taken into consideration by the Ministry of Youth and Sports, is a great message. I also think that in actually organizing the, all the logistics um, and uh, volunteering and graphics and everything with this conference, we've learned that 
Um, while we may have had our ups and downs in working with, uh, you know, the ministry and the youth council and sometimes even among each other, uh, we've learned that we have to work together to get results for young people. I need to, because there was a very important question addressed that matters to me personally a lot, um, about the referendum on uh, gay marriage. I'm, I have to, to address this and say that we as a council have been... Um, we have had to do an informing campaign to tell people that what does it mean to be from the LGBT community? What happens with children raised by the LGBT community? They're raised, they, they raise normally, there's no problem there. And basically to, to tell people that... Um, Așadar, din nou, bună ziua! Aveți în fața dumneavoastră pe Comisarul European Tibor Navracic și pe Ministrul Tineretului și Sportului Bogdan Matei. Vom avea traducere atât la întrebări cât și la răspunsuri. Vreți câte un cuvânt de deschidere sau direct întrebări? Questions. Am o întrebare pentru... Sunt Raluca Bărcă de la Antena 1. Am o întrebare pentru domnul comisar. Ok. Am o întrebare pentru domnul comisar. Voiam să menționez faptul că în România elevii până în clasa 9 dau cam șapte examene. Cum mi se pare această cifră? Cum este în alte țări? Și ce înseamnă acest lucru pentru un elev? Well, if those are easy exams, it's not a problem. If, if it's a, a difficult one, that might be how it's not my competence to, to judge the, the internal criteria of the education systems. What is important for us is to give young people competitive knowledge and competitive skills in the education systems. Da, nu știu, nu e treaba mea neapărat să judec criteriile interne ale unui sistem de învățământ. Dacă sunt examene ușoare, nu e o problemă, depinde și cum se simte elevii, dar cred că ceea ce trebuie noi să facem este să le dăm copiilor posibilitatea să se dezvolte într-un mediu educațional corect. Alte întrebări? Mai sigur? O altă întrebare ar fi de o, despre o inițiativă, un proiect care s-a discutat la nivelul Ministerului Educației. Doamna ministru spunea că se gândește să scoată câteva ore de sport de la clasele primare și l-aș întreba pe domnul comisar câte ore de sport ar trebui să facă, de exemplu, un elev care este în clasa întâi. Okay, so again, it is a very difficult issue because uh, there are a huge variation among the member states. Da, e o chestiune foarte, iarăși o chestiune foarte dificilă pentru că există variații foarte mari între statele membre. For instance, there is Italy where uh, there are no specifically educated physical education teachers in the primary education at all. De exemplu, există Italia unde nu avem profesori de sport, educație anume pentru orele de sport deloc. And the other extreme is, for instance, Hungary in the neighborhood where it is compulsory to have a physical education classes every day. Uh, și pe de altă parte, la cealaltă extremă, avem uh, Ungaria, aici vecină, unde este obligatoriu să avem fiecare zi ore de sport. We encourage the member states to introduce... Uh, As, physical as many physical education classes as possible, of course, but it's, it's up to the, to the national uh, decision makers to, to, to make these decisions. Noi, desigur, încurajăm statele membre să includă cât mai multe ore de sport cu putință, dar, desigur, rămâne decizia la nivelul statului membru. Bună ziua, aș vrea doar să continui. În primul rând să fac mențiunea că suntem la Forumul pentru Tineret, iar întrebările cred că ar fi trebuit să se adreseze atunci când există formul pe educație. Dar mă rog, 
să spunem că ați profitat de această ocazie. M-aș fi bucurat să aveți întrebări despre ceea ce s-a întâmplat astăzi la forumul pe tineret sau mai mult de atât să vă invit și la forumul pe sport unde să discutăm despre aceste probleme. Dar revin cu privire la orele de educație fizică și sport pentru că sunt profesor de educație fizică și sport. Niciodată nu s-a pus problema ca aceste ore să fie scoase. Ba mai mult de atât, cred că dacă facem o retrospectivă a ceea ce s-a întâmplat cu privire la predarea orelor de educație fizică și sport, acestea la ora actuală, în ciclul primar, și aici ne referim la clasa pregătitoare până la clasa a patra, sunt predate de către specialiști. Acești specialiști nu sunt altceva nimic decât profesorii de educație fizică și sport. Și mai mult de atât, după cum bine știți, Guvernul României a luat decizia de a construi și grădinițe sportive olimpice. Iar aceste grădinițe sportive olimpice vor fi construite tocmai în ideea de a ne adresa copiilor de la vârste foarte, foarte mici care să facă mișcare. Dacă vreți să discutăm despre câte ore de educație fizică și sport se desfășoară în sistemul de învățământ, o putem face fără niciun fel de problemă, însă, repet încă o dată, Guvernul României alocă o atenție deosebită atât educației fizice cât și sportului de masă. Mai departe, după cum bine știți și anul acesta, bugetul Ministerului a fost suplimentat cu peste 95%, tocmai în ideea de a veni în sprijinul sportului de performanță și în altă performanță. Și nu în ultimul rând vreau să le mulțumesc tuturor celor care au fost implicați în organizare, atât voluntarilor cât și colegilor mei, să-i mulțumesc lui Tibor pentru prezență și sunt convins că în continuare în continuare vom reuși să rezolvăm și să creăm soluții pentru o bună parte din problemele pe care tinerii ni le-au ridicat astăzi și în rest să vă urez dumneavoastră mult succes în tot ceea ce faceți, vă mulțumesc pentru prezență și sunt convins că în continuare vom avea aceeași colaborare foarte bună. Dacă mai aveți întrebări, da. Hello. Um, you talked today about the, um, one of the main priorities being the revitali revitalization of the pluralist uh, democracy in the EU over the next decade. Well, not you, but the officials present at the debate. Uh, and uh, some of this uh, means also a solid judiciary and a solid rule of law. Do you think that Romania has work to do in this field? And uh, How do you see this uh, priority from a Romanian point of view? There's always been debates at European level about the, the situation of the rule of law with some special member states. You, you may know that uh, there is an Article 7 procedure against Poland exactly on, based on, on those issues. And there is another Article 7 uh, procedure against Hungary based on, on also on rule of law and, and democracy issues. Uh, against Romania, there hasn't uh, been started any procedure yet. So that means that there might be debates. Sorry? Yeah, but the European Parliament discussed this topic. I think the European Parliament is a different institution. I'm a representative, I'm a representative of the European Commission, and there's no uh, such... Uh, Uh, process initiated so far. O întrebare pentru domnul ministru. Spuneați că ministerul se pleacă la problemele tinerilor și este foarte important dialogul cu ei. Concret, care sunt nevoile tinerilor, ce probleme au, cu ce soluții veniți pentru ca ei să rămână în țară? Problema majoră, după cum o bine știți, sunt loc, crearea de locuri de muncă. Asta este una dintre problemele pe care tinerii o ridică nu numai Ministerului Tineretului și Sportului, pentru că, după cum bine știți, nu numai Ministerul se ocupă de problema tinerilor, mai sunt și alte ministere care se ocupă de acest lucru. Dar <coughs> Guvernul României a făcut și face în continuare eforturi deosebite pentru a reuși acest lucru. După cum bine știți, rata șomajului este în scădere în România și asta ne arată că, da, într-adevăr, ne aplecăm asupra problemelor tinerilor care se confruntă astăzi. Dar asta nu înseamnă că am rezolvat toate problemele, ci sunt mult, mult mai multe probleme. Strict pe ceea ce înseamnă Ministerul Tineretului și Sportului, pe buget, dacă vreți, 
Uh, și anul acesta am încercat să suplimentăm suma pe ceea ce înseamnă proiecte uh, referitoare la uh, organizațiile non-guvernamentale care se adresează Ministerului Tineretului și Sportului. Știți foarte bine că deținem o serie de tabere care se adresează tinerilor în principal și anul acesta încercăm să investim în condițiile de cazare și masă ale tinerilor pentru a putea, într-adevăr, să le oferim confortul necesar, ba mai mult dată avem și un plan de investiții pe următorii cinci ani de zile cu prioritizare investiții în tabere, pentru că ne preocupă ca copiii, elevii și tinerii să meargă acolo, dar să meargă în bune condiții. Suntem într-o vizită permanentă în România pe tot ceea ce înseamnă uh, patrimoniu care îl deținem noi. După cum bine știți, suntem al doilea patrimoniu din țară după Ministerul Culturii, deci avem un patrimoniu destul de bogat, dar mai avem foarte mult de investit și foarte mult de lucru. Tocmai de aceea am stabilit alături de colegii mei că este nevoie de o prioritizare a investițiilor, pentru că nu vom putea să le facem pe toate. Și atunci, anul acesta, vom investi cu prioritate în opt tabere pe care noi le avem pe teritoriul României, tocmai în contextul de a asigura condiții foarte bune, foarte bune tinerilor. Însă, Repet încă o dată, ceea ce este îmbucurător este faptul că bugetul pentru Erasmus Plus va fi unul dublu și cu siguranță va reuși să acopere o bună parte din problemele cu care se confruntă tinerii din România și nu numai. Și acest lucru este îmbucurător și mai mult de atât și noi în calitate de guvern al României, prin proiectele pe care le avem și schemele de ajutor, încercăm să ajutăm cât mai mult tinerii, atât pe partea educațională, dar cât, atât și pe partea de integrare în, în societate. Mulțumesc frumos! Bun, dacă nu mai sunt uh, întrebări, uh, thank you very much, Commissioner, uh, domnule ministru, mulțumim mult de tot, o zi bună!